Next up, we have Dr. John Shrigley. Uh, John is a professor, uh, a graduate of the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And uh, following his oncologic pathology training at the University of Toronto and MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, uh, he was the director of surgical pathology at Sunnybrook Health Science Center and the chief of laboratory medicine at the Credit Valley Hospital. Currently, he's the chief and medical director of the program of laboratory medicine and genetics at Trillium Health Partners. I'm getting lots of tongue twisters tonight. One of the largest hospital organizations in Ontario and is also a professor in the Department of Pathology and Molecular Medicine at McMaster University. Uh, professor Shrigley is an international consultant and educator in the fields of oncologic and urologic, urologic pathology. So thank you for joining us this evening, Dr. Shrigley. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine, and, and thanks to Joan and to Deb for uh, their hospitality. Uh, actually, Andy Evans was the one that's supposed to be here tonight, but Andy's in Qatar or somewhere in the Middle East uh, giving lectures over there, so he asked me a few weeks ago whether I'd be able to do it. I'm really privileged to be able to do this. I don't get a chance that often actually to speak to uh, survivor groups or, or to the public, because as pathologists, we're talking more commonly to our, our surgical colleagues or our medical <laughs> colleagues, radiation oncology colleagues, radiologists, but it is a real privilege to be able to talk to everybody tonight about the pathology of kidney cancer. So what I want to do tonight is talk a little bit about the role of the pathologist in kidney cancer treatment. We're going to talk a bit about the anatomy and the types of specimens that we receive. We'll talk about why it takes so long for you to get a result sometimes of your specimen on a kidney cancer. The whole uh, the whole issue of the processing of the cancer. Then I want to talk about the specific elements of the of the pathology report for uh, patients with uh, kidney cancer. We're going to talk about the, the subtype or the classification of the tumor. I'm going to talk a bit about the stage of the tumor, which Craig has already uh, mentioned a little bit about, and also a bit about the grade of the tumor. Uh, then I'm going to m mention a bit about biomarkers, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about pathology standards in Canada, because you probably heard some bad press about pathology over the last of uh, five to ten years in Canada and elsewhere in the world as well. But the first thing I want to talk about really is the pathologist. So pathology is the study of disease, the mechanisms of disease, the causes of disease, how you diagnose disease. So that's really what it's all about. But I think the public for the most part, uh, with the exception perhaps of cancer survivors, might even not know what a pathologist does because people think of pathologists more in the realm of forensic pathology. So if you go uh, onto any TV show uh, during any night of the week and watch CSI or Criminal Minds or any of those shows, there's usually a glamorous uh, pathologist, you know, a, with, with Christian Louboutin shoes on, walking around in the morgue doing autopsies and all this interesting forensic work. So, but in, in Ontario, there's, there's about 420 pathologists, and probably only there's maybe about a dozen of them that do that kind of work full time. Uh, most pathologists work in hospitals, and the work we do really is surgical pathology and cytopathology. So we look at tissues and we look at cells, and 70% of our work is cancer related. So if you do the math there, 70% of the work out of about 400 pathologists in the province, we actually have more pathologists devoted to the cancer system than either radiation oncologists or medical oncologists when you actually figure out the numbers. So, so pathologists are really diagnostic oncologists. That's our work. We, we spend most of our time dealing with, uh, with oncology, with cancer diagnosis, with subtyping a tumor. Try, trying to figure out how aggressive it's going to be, what is the stage of the tumor, and all those sort of things. So we're also involved in the whole spectrum of cancer, right from prevention, identifying certain conditions, for instance, like, like Andrew mentioned about the issue of VHL. We can identify a lot of these things, sometimes histologically, then we can identify family members that are at risk. We're involved in the screening programs for cancer, so we have a huge role in, in the breast cancer screening program, cervical cancer, uh, colorectal cancer, the whole issue of uh, polyps. And of course, we're involved in the diagnosis and the prognosis and the prediction as well. There's certain tumors where we can actually identify specifically if a, uh, if a given tumor like a breast cancer is going to respond to a drug like Herceptin based on what we see down the microscope. So we basically are the diagnostic arm of oncology. That's sort of our role. 
So what I'd like to do now, uh, talk a bit about kidney cancer. So what we do is, uh, with respect to kidney cancer, we'll be examining the specimens that, that are derived from a, a kidney uh, specimen where there's, a, where there's a suggestion based on the imaging studies that you're dealing with the cancer. And we provide crucial information really that's guiding the treatment of individual patients and allow also the prognosis for an individual patient as well. Uh, we spend a lot of time dealing with the issue of uh, is a tumor benign or malignant? That's really what we're trained to do from a pattern recognition point of view. And specifically in kidney cancer, we document the subtype of the cancer. Is it a clear cell carcinoma? Is it a papillary carcinoma? Is it a chromophobe carcinoma? We look at the stage of the tumor, uh, how far is it, is it, has it extended anatomically, and the grade of the tumor, or how aggressive it is, and has it been completely removed? Are the margins of the surgical procedure free of tumor? So let's just go through a bit of basic anatomy first. So here on the screen, we have just sort of a very basic anatomy shot uh, showing the, the two kid, the paired kidneys with the adrenal glands that are above them. And then we have the blood vessels to the kidneys. So the, the blue, the red ones are the, are, are the artery. The big one going down the back is the aorta. And then the big blue one going down is the inferior vena cava. So you can see the branches of the renal veins and renal arteries that are going to the kidneys. And then we have the ureters that are coming out and draining the urine down into the bladder that you see at the bottom and coming out through the urethra. So that's sort of the basic anatomy of what the kidneys would look like and their adjacent structures. Uh, from a histological point of view, when we look down the microscope, so on the left-hand side, that's actually a kidney that's been bisected. So we're looking at the surface of the kidney. So if you've ever made steak and kidney pie, you've seen this sort of thing as well. So, uh, and in, in the center we have the, what's called the hilum of the kidney, and that's where the vessels come into the kidney. On the right hand side, this is what it looks like under the microscope. So we have structures, up here we have the structure called the glomerulus, which is important for filtering all the, all the blood and removing all the poisons from the bloodstream. And then uh, that's surrounded by tubules as well. There's all sorts of different types of tubules in the kidney. And they're all involved in the process of uh, uh, excreting all the waste products from the kidney, as well as maintaining a balance with some of the uh, some of the chemicals in the body, like sodium and potassium and those sort of things. So it has a lot of very intricate functions from a physiological perspective. Now, the types of specimens that we've uh, received, Dr. Getty's covered a few of them already. We we sometimes we see a needle biopsy, which is just a very thin core of tissue that's removed from a a kidney or a kidney tumor and uh, often in those cases we're able to make a very specific diagnosis based on that very small amount of tumor. Now from a therapeutic perspective the partial nephrectomy is when only part of the kidney is removed with with the tumor. A total nephrectomy is when all the kidneys are removed and a radical nephrectomy is when all the kidney and the surrounding uh, fat and the, uh, so often the adrenal glands are removed as well that's referred to as a radical nephrectomy. So these are the sort of common specimens that we would receive as pathologists that we have to analyze uh, for the surgeons and for the oncologists uh, that are working with us. So it's very important for you to understand your pathology report. And as Dr. Getty has mentioned, uh, everybody has, has the, uh, should be able to have access to their pathology report and have a, a complete understanding of what's in that report as well. So uh, a report is, every report is structured maybe a little bit differently in terms of the formatting of the report, but there's, there's a number of major themes that you see throughout a, a pathology report. So at the top of the report, as you can see here, we have the uh, demographic information. So the patient name, the identification numbers, the patient's date of birth, uh, the surgeon that's involved in that particular case. Then we have the, the specimens that was received. So what was this specimen that the surgeon sent to the pathologist for analysis? So that's a separate field in the report as well. Then we have another field which, which is referred to as the gross description, or what the pathologist sees when you look down, when you actually look at the specimen with your naked eyes. And there's a description in there as to what, this, what, type, what type of tissue you're dealing with, what is the label on the specimen, what are the measurements of the specimen, all those sort of things that sort of describe what you're seeing with your, with your eyes. And then the, probably the most important thing is the diagnostic field. So that is the field in the report where there's actually a diagnosis of the, of the cancer or the benign tumor, whatever it is, rendered. In this particular case, you can see that it's renal cell carcinoma, clear cell type, so that's one of the subtypes, or one of the classification types of kidney cancer. There's a measurement there of the size of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, uh, the status of the vein, the perirenal fat. So those are the things that define the stage of the tumor or how, what, what is the anatomical extent of the tumor, 
whether or not there's vascular space involvement in the margins. So that's sort of what we refer to as a, a synoptic report of all the important elements that relate to that particular type of cancer. So those are the major fields of a pathology report. So why does it take so long? I'm, everybody, when they have their surgery, there's a lot of people that are sort of saying, well, why isn't the pathology report out the next day, or why is it taking so long? Well, the process of actually going, uh, looking at a specimen and having it processed and then sort of reviewing those slides under the microscope is actually something that takes probably in the range, for a specimen of this type, in the range of anywhere from five to ten days in the, in the sort of system that we have here. In America, in some institutions, you know, where they have 24-7 uh, operations where the histology labs are working all weekend, they're set up to actually improve that turnaround time a little bit uh, better than that. But I think in the Canadian model, for the most part, I think five to ten days is what we try to, try to aim for. Uh, so what, we need, what happens in this situation, uh, the reason why is because it, it's a multi-step process that we're dealing with here. So the surgeon will send the specimen down to the pathologist. The very first thing is the pathologist has to examine that specimen grossly or macroscopically. And this is just a view here of what a, in a surgical pathology laboratory, the sort of instruments that we have for, for dissecting and for cutting and for removing the samples that we want to look at under the microscope. So this is a typical, the sort of what's referred to as a grossing bench in the surgical pathology lab. So this is an example here now where we've taken a kidney with a kidney cancer in it, and what we've done is we've cut it down and we've sort of folded it out like that. So you're looking at the top, you're seeing the, the tumor, which is up here, sort of bisected and folded out, and you can see that it, it, it's, a, it's an expansile tumor. It's a little bit more orange colored than the surrounding kidney, and it's about seven and a half centimeters in its greatest dimension. So those are the sort of things that we want to document uh, when we look at the gross uh, description of the, uh, of, the, of the specimen. So that's the first thing we do. Then the next thing we do is we want to take samples of that, of that tumor. So we take, samples, uh, to, uh, we take samples around the edge to see if the tumor is invading into the fat. We take samples around the blood vessels to see if the tumor is invading the blood vessels. And we also want to just do a random sampling of the tumor to make sure that we're looking at the whole tumor from the microscopic perspective. So what we do is we take those pieces of tissue and we put them in these little structures here called cassettes. And then the cassettes, what happens then is that tissue is processed. And by processing, we mean that the tissue, in order to cut the tissue very thinly so that we could stain it and look at it under the microscope, it has to be very hard. So what we do is we impregnate that tissue with wax. So that's referred to as the processing of the tissue. So this is just an instrument here for processing the tissue. And this is a process that usually occurs over a night. So we'd put all these blocks on the processor in the evening, and then they'd be ready the next day. All the tissue would be permeated with the wax, and they'd be ready to be cut. And the wax is then basically... Uh, what happens here is we, here's our tissue with our wax, and what the uh, technologist is doing there it is embedding that tissue so it's flat against one surface, so then we can actually take a very thin <coughs> instrument called a, a cryostat and we could, or a microtome, and we can cut it in very, very thin sections, usually about three or four microns in thickness. So that's the, uh, and this is what the blocks look like. So these blocks are all now ready. They're, they've been cooled on, uh, on ice, and they're ready for the technologist now to cut some very thin sections uh, to prepare the slides for the pathologist. And here's a, a technologist here showing uh, with a microtome, and you're taking these blocks and you're cutting very, very thin slices off them and then putting them on the slides uh, for, uh, for histology. As I said, they're very, very thin, usually less than five microns, often in the three to four micron range. Then what we do is we stain the slides these sections with uh, a number of different stains that have been used over the years and which are very standardized across the world uh, that we use for tumor classification. So the standard stains are called H and E, hematoxin and eosin, and that's what we use basically for tumor classification for the most part. There are, there are other special stains that we use, but this is sort of the uh, foundational stain for the classification of, uh, of tumors that we, that we see. So here's, so, th so at this point here, we see that we have the, the tissue has been processed, we have the blocks, and we have the slides that have been produced from those blocks. Now they're ready to go to the pathologist for examination. So that whole process takes, uh, takes probably a couple of days. Because what you usually want to do is you have to fix the tissue for a day, at least one day, and then you have to uh, examine it and cut it into these blocks. And then you have to, then the, 
the next process is making these blocks and cutting them. So at that point, you're probably about three or four days out. So that's when the case is usually ready to go to the pathologist for examination. So that's part of the reason why it takes, takes a bit of time. So then what do, we, so what do we do as pathologists? So we get these slides on the case. And basically what we're going to do is look at the slides and try to figure out, is this tumor a benign tumor? or is it a malignant tumor? So a malignant tumor is one that is cancer. That's the term we, uh, we use for a malignant tumor. There are a number of other tumors in the kidney that are benign tumors, like the oncocytoma is a nice example of a benign tumor, or an angiomyolipoma. So these are tumors that are, that are not gonna go on and cause any problems. Uh, so we have to separate those types of tumors from the tumors that are truly the cancers and can go on and cause other problems. So what the pathologist does in looking down at the, through the microscope is he use very established features and criteria that we learn through our training programs. And we have all sorts of atlases now, many of which now are online of different types of tumors. So we can compare, uh, and it's, it's, it's essentially a science of pattern recognition, very much like uh, radiology. So here, for instance, this is the World Health Classification uh, a classification book for tumors of the urinary system and the male genital organ. So there's a whole section there on the classification of kidney cancer. And this actual book came out in 2004. And actually there's a new classification that's just going to be released in 2013 that includes uh, at least eight new entities that were not present in this, in this system here. So the whole field is evolving very uh, dynamically. Uh, as uh, pathologists uh, not only look at this under the microscope, but we do a lot of genetic studies on these as well. So we work with our colleagues in molecular biology, and there's a lot of very interesting genetic and molecular uh, features that these tumors have too, in addition to the stuff that we see down, down the microscope. So this is just a few of the, uh, the common tumors that we see. On the bottom, we have a couple of the benign tumors, the oncocytoma and the angiomyolipoma. And on the top, we have the more common types of kidney cancer. So the clear cell carcinoma is the most common type of kidney cancer, accounting for about three quarters of the kidney cancers that we see in our population. Followed by the next most common is the papillary carcinoma, which can be further split into a type 1 and a type 2. And then a, a less common and relatively uncommon tumor is the chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. About 1 in 20 cancers are chromophobe renal carcinomas. And then there's a whole host of these other very, very rare cancers that would be, you know, one or two percent of the of the uh, of the overall population. So this is what we spend most of our career learning uh, through our residency programs, our fellowships, and through our practices, seeing uh, many different examples of these types of tumors, uh, and that's sort of the whole art and science of uh, of pattern recognition. Now, uh, and this is just for an example of uh, a very typical uh, clear cell carcinoma, kidney cancer. And uh, as Dr. Getty mentioned, in the background of that kidney cancer, there's, there's tons of little wee blood vessels. And that's why the VEGF uh, inhibitors are, are important in terms of uh, being able to attack those vessels so that that tumor does, can't grow and, and expand any further than it is. Now, why does it matter about the type of renal cell carcinoma? What, is there a difference between the clear cell carcinoma and the papillary carcinoma and the chromophobe carcinoma? Yes, there is. When you look at the, the data, the studies that have been done, and what these are, these are survival curves. So what these are basically is the, uh, the proportion of patients surviving over a period of time, number of years. So the higher the curve, the better. So you can see that the, uh, of the three common types of cancer, the chromophobe is better than the papillary, which is better than the clear cell. Over here in the papillary carcinomas, the type 1 tumors are better than the type 2 tumors. So those are what we refer to as survival curves. So we look at survival curves when we talk about the subtype of tumor, also the stage of the tumor, and also the grade of the tumor. So this is just sort of a common language that we have to discuss the sort of survival likelihoods uh, with, our, with our colleagues. And as well as the prognostic uh, value of, of subtyping the cancer, that different types of cancers have different prognosis. Uh, as Dr. Getty has mentioned as well, especially in the clear cell carcinomas, they're the ones where, you want, where you'd be thinking about using the, the VEGF antagonists or the mTOR inhibitors if these tumors had metastasized. Uh, so, so that's the sort of tumor that, whereas you would not be using that sort of thing with a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma. So the subtype also determines the treatment in addition to the prognosis. So that's why the, the classification or the subtyping is important. 
And there's some types of tumors that you just can't fit into any classification, and those we refer to as unclassified carcinomas. And what's happened over the years, as people have accumulated more and more of these unclassified ones, is that from that, uh, that whole group of potpourri of tumors, uh, we've, we can identify, because most, most of them are quite rare, you can start to identify patterns of new types of renal cancer. That, and then you could study those and look at the genetics of those. And that's why in the new classification system, there's at least eight new entities that have been described because they've been extracted out of this category of unclassified carcinoma. Now, what about the staging? We've already heard a little bit about the staging from Dr. Gay. <coughs> so the staging of the renal tumors or, or renal carcinoma is basically what is the anatomical extent of the tumor? Like, is it localized to the kidney? or is it beyond the kidney? So the term, the term that we use uh, in this is referred to as the TNM classification. So T stands for tumor, N stands for node, referring to lymph node, and M stands for metastasis. So the T category is defining the sort of local features of the tumor. So what is the size of the tumor? Is it confined to the kidney? Is it spreading out into the surrounding fat? Is it going into the adrenal gland? Is it going into the blood vessel? So that's the T category. The end category are, are the lymph nodes that are associated with that specimen positive or negative? And then the uh, end category is, is there evidence of distant metastasis? Is there a metastasis in the, in the bone, the brain, the lung, the liver, or other sites? So that's sort of a very standard terminology that we use, not just in kidney cancer, but all types of cancer. And this is the current uh, TNM staging uh, classification. This gets updated about every five years. So we're in the seventh edition now, which was published in 2010. And this is just showing the different uh, categories of, of uh, T categories and N categories that relate to kidney cancer. So this is a very detailed document. And as I said, it's updated on a regular basis. So everybody would have, with their tumor, they would have not only the type of tumor, clear cell carcinoma, but you'd have a T category, you'd have an N category, and an M category associated with, with your tumor as well. So what does this mean? So if you have a PT1B N0MX, what does that mean? So PT1B is a tumor that is confined to the kidney, so it hasn't spread into the surrounding fat or the adrenal gland or the blood vessels, uh, and the size is somewhere between 4 and 7 centimeters. So that's what that T1B means. N0 means there's no lymph node involvement, and MX, when there's an X behind that, beside that designation, means there's no tissue present to evaluate for metastasis. So that's sort of a code that we use for the anatomical extent of, uh, of kidney cancer, or for any cancer uh, for, that, uh, for that matter. So these are just some pictures. Here we have a uh, tumor. So the kidney is here. At the top, that yellow sort of crescent structure is the adrenal gland. And this circular lesion here, that's the kidney cancer. And if the kidney cancer is invading out into this white structure here, that's the fat, that would be a T3A. If it's invading into the adrenal gland, that would be T4. <coughs> if it's invading into the vein here, the blue structure, that would be a T3B. So that's how we sort of, the standardized terminology that we use, that, that the radiologists and the oncologists and the pathologists use. And here, for instance, this is showing that we have lymph nodes present. Those, the green structures are the lymph nodes that sit beside the kidney. So here we have positive lymph nodes, so that would be, that would be N1 disease. And why does stage matter? Well, stage matters for the same reason why the histological subtyping matters. And these, once again, are those survival curves I talked to you about before. So the higher the one, the higher the level, the flatter the curve at the top, the better it is. And you can see as you go from stage one to two to three to four, stage four is down there with, with very poor survival out to, uh, out to five to ten years. But, of course, the stage would always have to be taken into account with the, uh, with the subtype of the tumor. Another thing that the pathologist always reports in the surgical pathology report is, is the tumor completely removed? So what is the margin status? Has the surgeon got all the tumor, to the best of the knowledge of the pathologist? So that's what we refer to as the margin status of the tumor. So that's a very, very important observation that would be included in the, uh, the pathology reports for kidney cancer as well. Now, what about grading? So grading is something that's different. Grading is a measure of the aggressivity of the tumor based on sort of the, the very detailed morphological features that the pathologist sees under the microscope, generally using fairly high power observation. So the uh, 
So what does the grade, grade mean? So the grade of a tumor is the degree to which the cancer cell resembles benign cells from which it arises. So the low-grade cancers, uh, the more indolent cancers, tend to look very, the, the, the cells and the nuclei look very much like the sort of normal cells and nuclei. Whereas the more aggressive cancers tend to be more disorganized. So this is just a picture here in the bottom showing the cell membrane, a nucleus, a structure in here that's called the nucleolus, and this is a cytoplasm here, so membranes, cytoplasm, nucleus, nucleolus. And if you look uh, on sort of a scale of uh, aggressivity, let me just focus here, let's go through these. So you go from the left to the right, so the, the benign cells often look like this, so they have very uh, regular round uh, nuclei, they don't have any of these nucleoli that are present here. And as you go from a low-grade cancer to a high-grade cancer, you get more and more disorganization of the cancer cells, more irregularity, enlargement of the nuclei, and very prominent nucleoli. So that's what we mean by grading of a kidney cancer. And there are a number <coughs> of uh, grading systems that are available, and these are just some of them. The ones that, um, that have been used most commonly are the Furman nuclear grade, and actually there's a new system that's come out and it's going to be published very shortly this year that's going to be probably the new international standard for grading kidney cancers uh, that should be published by the end of the year. But it's the Furman system is the one where probably most of the information is present. That one, and that's the new one that's coming out soon. So this is just a, a, a pictorial image of, the, of what tumors would look like. This would be a grade one tumor grade 2, grade 3, and this is the more aggressive looking grade 4 tumor here. And these are sort of the average of survivals of statistics, so 86% survival, 75, 51, 29. So when you're trying to get an estimate of the prognosis of your individual cancer, you have to take into account the, the type of the tumor, the stage of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, has the tumor been completely removed? Are the margins negative? So these are all things in the pathology report that are important for the overall prognosis. Now, what about national standards? So there was a, there was a consensus meeting back in 2008 that, that sort of took place. It took place in Canada, and it sort of defined a lot of the, uh, the features. What, what was the standard of practice related to kidney cancer at that time? And what the standard of practice is with respect to uh, the reporting of kidney cancer, in fact, is the... College of American Pathologists uh, checklist for kidney cancer. So uh, this one was published in 2005. It's been updated. We have a 2012 version out now of this of this checklist, and this allows the pathologist to go through the case and to make sure that all the important things are listed on the pathology report. So you don't have any errors of omission, if you will. So all the things that are related to the classification of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, the stage of the tumor, the margin status, and all those sort of things are, are listed in a very systematic way. And in the province of Ontario, <coughs> we have all of this information now captured in a very large database that resides in the Ontario Cancer Registry at Cancer Care Ontario. So all these elements and all the kidney cancers in, in Ontario are now actually structured pathology reports that are available through our, our database at Cancer Care Ontario. What about biomarkers? Just a word about biomarkers. So what is a biomarker? Well, a biomarker is a biochemical or molecular or genetic feature that can be used to predict how a cancer will behave, uh, could, could be measured to, uh, to, to measure the pro, uh, prognosis of pro, uh, progression of a disease, or to predict if a treatment will work, or to assess the effects of treatment. So those are what, what a biomarker would be. So, with respect to uh, the classic biomarker, as I alluded to before, I guess the breast cancer and Herceptin would be a classical biomarker. So this is a biomarker uh, where the pathologist will look and we'll, we can identify these receptors uh, for Herceptin on the membrane of the cancer cells. So we actually include that observation in our pathology report that it's HER2 new positive. And if the patients that are HER2 new positive, uh, if, if it's a questionable result, then we can use genetic studies to actually confirm that result. And those are the patients that would be offered the possibility of having perceptin for their bladder cancer, so, or for their, sorry, for their breast cancer. So this is what we refer to as more of a personalized medical treatment. So in other words, there's a specific marker that's on the cell that we can identify pathologically or genetically, and that particular marker is going to drive a very specific drug 
that's sort of geared towards uh, that particular receptor. So that's sort of the classic example, if you will, of personalized medicine. And what the, ho the whole aim, I think, with, with cancer biology these days is to identify other targets like this in other diseases such as, as kidney cancer. Um, so the, with respect to uh, biomarkers in kidney cancer, uh, the HER2 news story in breast cancer began about 15 years ago. And it's one that's still evolving and still sort of changing a little bit. For kidney cancer, at present, there's no specific biomarkers that have been identified for mainstream use at this time. There's all sorts of things that are sort of in a developmental phase. Um, there's a lot of very interesting work that's being done in a lot of different research facilities, including Princess Margaret, including at the NIH group. Uh, but at this point in time, there's nothing really that's there, that's right there that we can use as a specific biomarker uh, for kidney cancer, unfortunately. But I'm very uh, confident there will be within the next probably five years. And this is just a, a picture here of, of uh, very interesting work that's been done by uh, groups of investigators throughout the world. But this is from Finn Kay's group in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan, looking at kidney cancer from a molecular signature point of view. And what they find is that all these types of kidney cancers, in fact, are very unique uh, signals in terms of their, of their molecular biology or their molecular genetics. So this, this sort of work that's being done from a molecular perspective is going to be able to identify subtypes, even subtypes within the clear cell category that may have specific responses to certain types of drugs. So this is a sort of research that I can see over the next few years that's going to, that's going to be very positive in terms of causing or allowing one to sort of uh, create, you know, some very, very novel treatments for, for kidney cancer, uh, which will have, uh, which will be effic efficacious uh, in the population. Now, let me just finish up, because I think we're going a bit over, over time here, but just saying a few words about pathology in Canada. Because there have been a number of, uh, of problems and things in the, in the press over the last five to ten years regarding kidney cancer. There was the the scandal in, uh, in Newfoundland regarding the uh, breast markers, which caused a lot of problems. There was some issues, of course, in Windsor that probably everybody read about a few years ago about some problems with surgery and pathology in Windsor. There was some stuff in Owen Sound. So the, there's been a lot of stuff going on in the press. So I think people are a little bit uh, uneasy sometimes about the pathology. But from, from your perspective, there's a few things that you should be aware of. So when should I get a second opinion on my kidney cancer pathology? Well. I think, it, certainly if the tumor is an unusual tumor, I think if, if you're, uh, like, clear cell carcinoma and papillary carcinoma, those are the tumors that pathologists see all the time, so we're, we're pretty good at looking at those. But if you get into some of the more unusual types of kidney cancer, then I think it's worthwhile to have an expert take a look at those, uh, th those tumors and help with the classification, because that's where you can really uh, sort of get some additional sort of information regarding the kidney cancer, if it's, sort of, or if it's in that unclassified category. Those are the sort of situations where you want to get another pathologist who's ideally a specialist in that area to look at the case. Uh, so how do I get a second opinion? Well, I think everybody's entitled to a second opinion. I think the best way to do it is just to ask your, uh, your urologist or your oncologist that, that's treating you that, you know, you feel uneasy, or maybe the, the oncologist themselves would want to make that decision themselves by, it's an unusual situation, I'm going to get this case looked at by a specialist in urological pathology. But everybody has a right to do that. Um, so given some of these recent stories, are pathology errors a big problem in Canada? I don't think so. I really don't think so. I think that the pathology errors, when you look at them relative to, to other types of medical errors, are in fact are quite low. Uh, you know, and some of the medication errors, I and mean, we're hearing these last couple of days of all this issue with, uh, you know, with chemotherapy and everything. So, uh, you know, it, things happen, you know, both whether you're in diagnostics or therapeutics, I think, you know, uh, what we're, pathologists are a conscientious group. I think this is an interpretive specialty. Uh, there are a lot of challenges sometimes, especially in some of these difficult cases. Uh, so I think it's important to realize that Pathology is not a lab test. This is not a hemoglobin that you're getting here when you're, when you're getting a pathology opinion. So a pathologist, you can see that there's this whole process of processing the tissue, making the slides. The pathologist is basically rendering a medical opinion on that case. So the pathologist is no different than the surgeon doing the surgery. They're, they're, they're doing the diagnostic aspect of things. So it's not like a hemoglobin. It's not like an electrolyte, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, errors do occur sometimes, you know, just like because everybody's human and, and things are, and we do have systems in place now to help uh, to help to allay that. 
we have uh, systems of being able to show things to colleagues to uh, to refer on for uh, specialty consultation, etc. So I think you should be confident about the quality of the pathology in Canada. Uh, some of the challenges we have. Defining what is error, uh, because a lot of the times this is not necessarily error, this is just a difference of interpretation. There might not actually be any truth involved here. How do you define truth with respect to some of these borderline cases? What is an acceptable error rate? Uh, some of the problems we have with the increasing workload that we have is we need a lot more pathologists. We're estimated we need another 500 new pathologists over the next decade in Canada. Right now in Canada, there's probably about 1,300 uh, pathologists. So there's a lot of people that, are, my vintages are gonna be retiring soon, so we need people to replace that. Plus we have increasing workload, increasing case volume, uh, renal cancer is more common. As you can see, there's more imaging being done, so there's more biopsies, there's more surgery, there's more complexity, there's more sort of markers that we have to do in these cases to be sure about our diagnosis. So everything is increasing in terms of, uh, uh, you know, of, of workload. And it, it's always, it, I think it's important for the pathologist to take time and look at the case carefully. And this is a famous uh, expression that I've seen people use before, sign out in haste and regret in leisure. So if, you're, if you try to rush things too much as a pathologist, especially if you're, if you're looking at a, comp a complex cancer case, you can make mistakes. So it's better to take a little bit of time and show it to your colleagues and make sure that you've done all those, those quality maneuvers. So um, what we have covered, let me just see. So action items. One, recruit more medical students into pathology. I think that's important. Improve the image of pathologists. Don't, don't think of us as people doing autopsies in some board for forensic purposes. We are the diagnostic oncologists of society. Uh, we have to uh, have better national and provincial quality assurance programs. We're actually working on that through Cancer Care Ontario as we speak. We've, uh, we've uh, accomplished standardized synoptic style reporting in the province of Ontario, which is an amazing feat. Uh, that virtually all our <coughs> cancer cases now are, are captured in a very, very standardized format based on the College of American Pathology checklist. And I think we need more subspecialization as well, more people that have expertise in various areas like urological pathology and kidney cancer. So those are the sort of things that are the action items. So what, we, what I've tried to cover tonight is the role of the pathologist in kidney cancer treatment and in oncology generally. Uh, a little bit about the anatomy and the types of specimens. How a, pro a specimen is processed in the pathology lab and why it might take five to ten days. The important elements of the kidney cancer pathology report, so the subtype or the classification of the tumor, the grade of the tumor, and the pathological stage. A little bit about biomarkers, but not a, not a whole lot going on right now. And a little bit about the pathology standards in Canada. So thank you very much.